Can I go ahead? Thank you. Okay. Welcome, and thank you for standing by. Mm -hmm. At this time, all participants are on a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, to ask a question, press star 1 on your touchtone phone and record your name at the prompt. This call will be recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Dr. Aro. Sir, you may begin. One more time. Uh, let's see whether we can do it better this time. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Prevention Science Series. It gives me tremendous honor to have here talking to us today Dr. Dennis Fortenberry, who has been pushing uh, the envelope for quite a few years now, especially regarding sexual behaviors of adolescents. Dr. Fortenberry is a professor of pediatrics at Indiana University Division of Infectious Diseases, and he has guided a research program focused on adolescents for over 17 or 18 years now. Um, he has been looking at the contextual and interpersonal factors associated with adolescent sexual activity. He has focused on day-to-day -day variations in mood as predictors of sexual activity among adolescent women. Uh, he um, <clears throat> has his education, actually a multidisciplinary education, starting with uh, a degree from Oklahoma State University followed by a medical degree from University of Oklahoma School of Medicine, um, internships uh, at University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center in internal medicine residency at Bryn Mawr Hospital in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, and a master's degree in epidemiology and biostatistics from the College of Public Health at the University of um, Oklahoma. He has awards from the American Sexually Transmitted Disease Association, from Indiana University uh, Trustees, and from Society of Adolescent Medicine. He's going to talk to us today uh, about the microbiome of the penis in adolescent men. Maybe you are remembering uh, the lecture we had listened to from Jeannie Morazzo, who was on the microbiome, but that microbiome was in women's vagina. So, Dennis. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate the invitation from all of you. It's nice to see people that I know and have worked with for many years now. And I hope I'm going to bring you some information and a perspective about some things that I think can inform hopefully a new generation of approaches, both from a research and from a public health operations standpoint that will help us do an even better job of taking care of our young people who are engaging in sexual behaviors and are at risk for sexually transmitted infections. So it may seem a little strange to ask a question like, why should we even care about a penis? Or even more particularly about the microbiome that's associated with it, but I think among other things, if you start thinking about sexually transmitted organisms as part of that microbiome, as part of the things that go back and forth between people during sexual encounters, then understanding what else is there, what else is present in the, in the parts of the penis that are relevant to us may be important. It's become clearly important in terms of human immunodeficiency virus infections as we've learned more about human papillomavirus infections, we begin to understand its role for this particular organ, organ as a transmitter of those viruses and their subsequent long-term association with cervical, oral, genital, and anal cancers. If you think about the incredible attention and focus on the role of circumcision as probably the single most effective intervention for the prevention of HIV infections in men that currently exist, and think about the role that's part and parcel of the penis as in terms of, and it may be that the reason that circumcision works has as much to do with the changes in the microbiome that happen 
after circumcision. I'll show you a bit of data about that. I think maybe the fundamental reason, at least for me, is understanding why the penis is important, how it participates in this larger transfer of organisms, whether they're the ones that we can traditionally call sexually transmitted, or the ones that are present in everyone's body and get passed back and forth, for which we don't fully understand the function. That part, I think, is even the most interesting of this. The focus on adolescence, I think, takes a different perspective. The reason that I'm fascinated with this age group, and particularly interested in the issues of the development of sexuality during the adolescence, is to think about the transformation of our bodies that occurs during puberty, how that changes our orientation towards sexuality, which is always present in us prior to puberty, becomes manifest in particular ways with the body changes associated with puberty, with the brain changes associated with puberty, and with the social changes that accompany both of those. Those are the times when most young people initiate a variety of both solo, in this case we're talking about masturbation, and partnered sexual activity. I'm going to make a case that all of those sexual activities are relevant to understand the microbiome of the penis. And of course, this issue of partner change, as young people initiate partnered sexual behaviors, they don't always do it with the same person. So they're exposing themselves to a variety of microbiota in other people's bodies as they move from partner to partner. Partner change is, in fact, sort of the sine qua non of sexual public health, right? That's where we most see the important facets of the epidemiology of most sexually transmitted infections. I'm going to introduce the theme here that, that I'm going to carry through the rest of this. And it's this idea of form, function, and microbiota. And my perspective on this is just, is that just studying organisms is necessary but insufficient to understanding why these organisms are important relative to the sexual interactions that are the basis of our profession and the organisms that we identify as the ones targeted for our interventions. It's important to me to also think along the lines that we're not just talking about one particular microenvironment. If you think about the sexually transmitted infections that we focus on, organisms or infections like human papillomavirus infect a particular type of body site have a particular predilection to certain areas of the penis, and those areas are different than the ones that are typically infected by chlamydia, by gonorrhea, by trichomonas. So I'm going to talk here as if there are at least a couple of compartments of relevance. The coronal sulcus, which is on the outside of the penis, I'll give you a little bit more detailed anatomy lesson in just a minute, and the distal urethra, which is the place where Chlamydia infections, gonococcal infections typically occur, at least in the genitals. This idea of function has to do with the idea of how the penis operates as a sexual appendage, as a copulatory organ, as it's often stated, and the way that it episodically interacts with other microbial communities. As Dr. Marazzo talked about the microbial communities of the vagina then, in fact, the vagina is a place where the penis periodically dwells for a finite period of time during sexual contact. And there's an exchange of organisms. And we know that happens because people get guns, because people get chlamydia, because people get trichomonas. There has to be a way for moving those organisms from one part of another person's body to the penis of a male partner. The oropharynx is an important sexual organ. I think many of us don't think about other body parts as sexual organs, but it's important to realize that people use almost all of their body in sexual interaction. And the microbial communities of the mouth are quite different than the 
microbial community because of the bite of the vagina or the anus or even the skin, skin of the hands, skin of other parts of the body that come in contact during sexual interaction. I'm going to shift now to try to work through this analogy to give you a sense of how I think about this and how I've come to think about it as we put this research into play. I'm going to talk about this difference between the coronal sulcus and the distal urethra. Just to review a little bit of the anatomical relationships of the penis and the rest of the male genital urinary tract, just to give you a sense of the, the place of the bladder, the seminal vesicle. The seminal vesicle, as you see there, is responsible for about 70% of a normal male ejaculate, which is about 5 milliliters. The remaining 30% or so comes from the prostate gland. I think many men have the idea that most of semen is, is sperm, but in fact that only makes up about 1 or 2% of most ejaculates. The urethra itself, you can see, has a total length of about 20 centimeters from the, from the distant opening up to the bladder. And then that distant part here, that I'm referring to that has to do with the head of the penis, the glands penis, the foreskin, and the distal ure urethra. So that's a distance of probably four to five centimeters. Remember the urethra itself is not a straw. I think that many people also think of it as a tube that's perfectly smooth and which Urine passes through unobstructed, but in fact, it's a tissue. So there are ridges to it. It has texture. There are crypts. There are places where there's surface for organisms to go. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. I found that a lot of people don't know what a foreskin looks like or what it is. So I think it's important for everyone to have that in the head. But this is a fold of stratified squamous epithelium. So this is skin. On its outer part, it's stratified and squamous in the same way as the skin in most other parts of our external bodies. On the inside, it's also stratified epithelium, but it's moist. During arousal, during sexual, during erection, that force, that fold pulls back so that in fact its inner surface is now exposed to the environment. It becomes dry if, if the erection, if there's no moisture in the environment, or it can't take the moisture that it's surrounded by. So those, that area between the lines is the inner surface of a foreskin. So this is the way it looks in, in the microscope. So this lets us zone in. So I'm going to be making the point that What's in the penis has a lot to do with how the microorganisms work relative to the penis and how those microorganisms might interact both with sexual exposures and with the young man's, or the, in this case any man's, immune system. So in panel A of this, it's a cross-section through a foreskin on your left and the head of the penis, and you basically see two layers of stratified squamous epithelium running in those pink bands up and down across that gulf. In panel B, you see a section through the meatus, the opening at the end of the penis where sperm or semen and urine passes. The arrow pointing in showing that those, there's a reflection of Hornified skin. So this is just like skin on the external part of your body that runs its short distance inside the meatus. If you go to panel C, see the, the distinction between on the left, the stratified squamous epithelium, those are the cells that human papilloma virus would normally choose to infect. In fact, that's all it can infect. So that's the place where HPV makes its home, 
right at the arrow, you see that very sharp transition to columnar epithelium. Those are the cells that gonococci and chlamydia would preferentially infect because they can't infect stratified splenic cells, at least not very well, not apparently in in vivo circumstances. So part of, I think, my point here in terms of the issue of anatomy is that it makes a difference because you've got different kinds of cells there. You've got different immune cells. So in the stratified squamous epithelium, you have a fairly high population of Langerhans cells. So if you're thinking about HIV, you're thinking about cells like that that HIV can infect. Once you move to the columnar epithelium, you're thinking about macrophages, you're thinking about lymphocytes. It's a different type of cell that has the receptors that HIV can infect. And the density of those cells probably has something to do with the resonant micro microflora that are present on or near the surface of the cells that those immune cells cluster around. So that's the issue where form starts to make a difference in terms of understanding the microbiome. This is the way it begins, just as a, a way of thinking about it in a cartoon way. So working from, I really love the osteum external urethrae, sort of just comes out naturally. As you move in, then you see this first area of non-keratinized squamous epithelium with a lot of glycogen in it. Now, you may remember even from the talk about the vaginal microbiome that the reason the vaginal microbiome looks a particular way and has a particular microbial characteristic is because of the presence of glycogen under the stimulation of estrogen is, is preferentially used by lactobacillus to create a vaginal microenvironment that's acidic and relatively impervious to other kinds of infections when that's the case. And I'll show you data in a little bit that, in fact, you find a fair population of lactobacillus probably from this area. And then as you move back to the stratified columnar epithelium, that's the area, if you've ever worked in an STD, to put a swab into, into the urethra, that's the target area. But that's where the gonorrhea is. That's where the chlamydia is. That's what you're shooting for. And you know you've gotten there because the man said, stop. I'm going to shift this to function a little bit because I want to get in your heads a little bit that just what's there is static. That's static anatomy, that's static immunology. That's, if anything, a static microbiome. And that's not going to help us really understand how sex functions in this set of, in of infection. So when you're talking about young men, I hope I don't have to make too strong of a case for the fact that they do, in fact, have sex. I do want to make a point that it's not just sex with other people. That masturbation becomes a prevalent behavior during early adolescence and becomes more prevalent during later adolescence, as you can see by the rising percentages, and, in fact, stays highly prevalent in them through the lifespan up until around 60 or 65 not just solo masturbation, because people touch each other in partnerships, and they masturbate each other as a sexual behavior that's characteristic of that relationship, or at least that exposure. They give oral sex to each other. In this case, someone else gives. I'm talking about a young man receiving oral sex from a partner, and from my perspective, I don't care if the partner is male or female. Vaginal intercourse, obviously, the kind of thing that people most often think of when they think about sex. Anal sex is not that common in young people, but it does happen. And then when you see that any part of sexual behavior, again, it increases as people grow. So part of my fascination with adolescence is the fact that it's a moving target, that a 14-year-old is not the same as a 15-year-old who's not the same as a 17-year-old. And that's the kind of thing that fascinates me because I think it gives us opportunity to watch how the 
the microbiome, how the immune system start interacting with behaviors in ways that will inform us how to better take care even of older people. So I just want to sort of put a couple of things in your head with this picture. This is a magnetic red, uh, MRI study of two people in coitus. If you want to know how they got people in a scanner, um, you'll have to read the paper. On the, on the right side, it's almost a, an exact replication of the sagittal section cartoon that I showed you earlier. So if you see, you can see the end of the coccyx on the right. You can see the, the white space marked bladder. You can see the S, which is the pubic symphysis, the bone. And then the penis, when we can see the UR that marks the urethra, moving into the vagina. You can see that the intersection, the interaction of the head of the penis and the cervix. So the, the point I want to make about this, even though this is a static image, and I'll get to that in a second, is that think of yourself for a moment. Do a little experiment with me. Think of yourself as a chlamydia elementary body. Get your heads into it. So you're there, and the fact that you're there shows that evolutionarily you've made it because you're an elementary body. But if you stay there, you're at a dead end. Your only option at this point to survive because this woman's immune system is getting ready to get you. You've been there for a while. You can probably stay a lot longer, but the immune system's going to pick you off. And unless you go to another body, you won't make it. So you've got three things to figure out there. The first one is, if I go to another body, do I need to take something with me? Another, what kind of things do I need to go? What supplies, what colleagues do I need to go with? The second thing is, what's it going to be like on the other side? You can think of this as an immigration if you want to. If you want to think of a committee elementary body as a pilgrim, and that the penis here is Plymouth Rock, I think the analogy works. So you've got to think, is that place where we're going, is it going to be hostile? Are the inhabitants hostile? Can the land itself and that environment support me so that I can additionally fulfill my evolutionary drive that my DNA is pushing me to do? I'm going to get to those two parts in just a minute. But the third piece that you have to answer at that committee elementary body is, how do I get there? What vehicle can I use? So here's where I think this idea of why sex matters comes into play. So if you think about the actual physics of sex, sexual intercourse, from the perspective of that chlamydia elementary body, one of the questions I've never been able to fully understand is how organisms get into the male urethra. The male urethra is not just a highway that you turn into and drive down. Men that sit in a bathtub don't get water in their urethra. Men that swim don't get water in their urethra. So there's got to be some mechanism for pushing those organisms in because they don't fly, they don't have feathers, they don't have feet, they can't walk, they don't have fins, they don't swim. So this is something that's always hit me is how do they get there? And if you remember, the target is about a centimeter in width. That's the urinary meatus, the, the osteum urethrae. It's a pretty small target. If they miss that, they, they've missed the boat, so to speak. So I, I think my model for how this happens is that during thrusting, which is a nearly universal behavior, pattern of mating among a lot of higher animals. There's compression and decompression. So the vagina, the mouth, and the ants are all 
high compliance vessels. That means that with thrusting, you don't get much change in pressure, but you get some. And that means that sex doesn't kill us or hurt, but it, move, it creates an ebb and flow that is, I think, the engine for how the bacteria enter the urethra. In the microfluid layer, now the, the physics of microfluid layers are different than the physics of fluid running in a creek or in a river or in a stream across your floor after, after your sink stops up. They, so fluids act differently, and I, there, I can't find any literature on this. I started a conversation once with, a, with an engineer at Purdue, and we didn't get very far. I think he had trouble thinking about vaginal microfluid layers over the so surface of the penis. But I think that's the place where the organisms are set, being moved back and forth. Once you have a connection in the urethra, which in this model I named as the pre-ejaculate that comes from the bulbal urethral gland, it's probably about a milliliter or less of fluid, you can connect the two fluids. At that point, you have a pathway for organisms to come into the urethra probably in association with ejaculation, although I'm not sure about that. And it's a process that has to occur pretty rapidly because, as you can see from these data, the way they did this, they gave men and women in couples stopwatches, designated one of them as the timer, and had them start the top stopwatch when the penis went into the vagina and stop when the man ejaculated. As you can see, and they had them do this for a month. People will really work with you on this. It's pretty amazing. As you can see, it doesn't take very long. The penis is not resident in the vagina for very long, five, six minutes a month, on average, at least in the meeting. So now I want to get to some of this. So what I hope to have done now is give you a sense that I'm going to talk about organisms now but it's never going to be enough. No matter what we understand about the microorganisms, what we understand about them as entities in our bodies, it will never be sufficient to help us understand sexually transmitted infections. We must understand how they interact with our bodies and then how our bodies operate sexually with other bodies if we're going to understand because that's what sexual transmission means. So my impetus to this work was through something that's come to fruition over the past year called the Human Microbiome Project. And this was a project that was developed to, its, a, it's original impetus was to describe the core microbiota of all of the main compartments of the human body. This was limited to 242 adults, 18 to 40, so it didn't even include younger people. Two sites only, Houston and St. Louis. 15 body sites in men and 18 in women. And if you look through the list, you've got a variety of places in the mouth. The nose, because of the interest in, in staph infections particularly. Skin, two behind the ears and two left and right from the elbow, from the antecubital fossa, three sites in the vagina, humans from the HMP perspective, human males didn't count because the genitals, the urethra, the penis was not included in the human microbiome project. So part of, that was part of the impetus for beginning to start thinking about how to do this. About the same time, there was a lot of research coming out about circumcision, about how circumcision worked. Strong trials from Africa and other places demonstrated the efficacy for the prevention of HIV infections in men. And this paper came out in PLUS One from a study of 12 men in Kenya, pre and post circumcision, 12 adult men showing really marked changes 
in the particular types of bacteria that were present on the coronal sulcus pre and post circumcision. So if you look at those two organisms on the left that markedly increase in their proportion of sequences after circumcision, that suggests that what happens after circumcision is that coronal sulcus skin starts looking very much like other skin populations. Now, skin populations differ radically. They differ from left anticubital fossa to right anticubital fossa, but they do have some generalities in common. What you also see is the group of, of, that includes Prevotella and other kinds of things markedly decreases after circumcision, in fact, goes away. And that suggests that there's conceivably some role for those bacteria that leave or that come on in terms of the interactions with the immune system that helps the post-circumcision penis be less susceptible to HIV. So that was, the, that was where some of this began to come into play for us in terms of designing this research. We didn't really know much about it, about the urethral microbiome. When I started, I still had infectious disease specialists say, we all know that the male urethra is sterile. Now, it's been demonstrated at least since 1980 that there probably are small populations of resident bacteria, but it's been difficult to study. All of the studies use culture, and we know very well for the past decade, decade and a half, that a huge proportion of bacteria in our bodies are not culturable, or at least haven't been cultured. So what we knew was not very much. I pulled this one study because it did focus specifically on adolescent men and at least divided them into whether they had ever had sexual intercourse, coitus, or not. As you can see here, there are a couple of interesting things about this. One, this idea that lactobacillus, so the, the bacteria that you heard about as an intrinsic part of the healthy vagina is also an intrinsic part of the male urethral bio, microbiome. I think that's an important part. And it may be more important after sexual activity has begun than before. And I want to shift you all the way to the end. So Gardnerella vaginalis, thought to be a critical organism in the production of the condition bacterial vaginosis with all of its issues related to reproductive health, particularly its association with reproductive health disparities, especially in African-American women, start seeing the idea that Gardnerella vaginalis is a part of the male microbiome, urethral microbiome, particularly after sexual activity has started. I'll show you more about this in a moment. So our first study with this was not actually with adolescent men, it was with adult men. These were men recruited from our STD clinic, where we basically were trying to get an understanding of what was there. And this is where we were testing things out and published this a couple of years ago now. And so what we did, we took those samples, we sequenced their 16 srRNA DNA sequences. So this is a DNA sequence of the rRNA. And then compared it to a big database of other sequences to see what it most resembled. So almost 13% of those sequences represented lactobacillus lactobac enters. Enters is a really interesting lactobacillus. It was not even described until the mid or late 1990s. You haven't known about it very long. It's difficult to culture. It has a tiny genome, so it doesn't make much of its own stuff. It needs help from other organisms. It doesn't make hydrogen peroxide. It doesn't do things that, you, that are often associated with lactobacillus. And it's the most common lactobacillus in, in women. So it's really important in some ways that we still don't understand, which clearly don't understand its role in men, but it's there. 
we saw a lot of other things that come that were described originally, or at least from this source, in from the vagina, from other parts of the reproductive tract, including things, the Smethia, the Gemella, the Aerococcus, the Prevotella, all of which have been associated as contributors to bacterial vaginosis, and we were finding them in there. Adipobium vagina is another one that is, is metronidazole resistant, so part of failure sometimes in treatment of bacterial vaginosis may come from this organism and may be a contribution. So what we were seeing was a lot of resemblance of the patterns in men that were recognizable in terms of vaginal microbiota from women. When we separated those groups out in men with a sexually transmitted infection, in this group most of those infections were due to gonorrhea and not chlamydia. We actually saw that the microbiota clustered predictably into two groups so that we could identify on the basis of these clusters whether or not they had a sexually transmitted infection or not, suggesting the ways that the STI itself might change the resident microbial environment. So that's when we put together our project we call the Young Men's Project, which is a subgroup of projects within the Human Microbiome Project. And our objectives there, we thought we needed to do something to just understand what was there. These were 14 to 17 year old young men. And we didn't care whether or not they had ever had sex before. We just wanted to know whether they had or not. We wanted to see what was there based on what they had, what they had already done. And then we wanted to follow them forward. So my sense is when you, when you do stuff with teenagers, although I think this is true with adults as well, you have to remember that things change over time. These are moving targets. Sex doesn't happen all the time. If you want to know something about sex, you have to watch for it to happen. And it doesn't happen every day. So you actually have to gather a lot of data about things waiting for the exposures to happen so that you can time them carefully. Identify prospectively new sexually transmitted infections, which we did in this case with nucleic acid amplification tests, and then try to look and see how things changed over time. I don't know, have anyone been to Prague and seen this particular, by the Franz Kafka House, if you're interested in literature, or if you're interested in the male urethral microbiome, you can go to the Kafka house later. But the first thing we wanted to do was take the idea that we didn't think we could do a prospective longitudinal field study of the male urethral microbiome using swabs. And just think about it for a second and the practicalities or the impracticalities of that I think will be obvious and they will be especially if you see what we would have had to do to, or in order to sample with swabs the, the urethra. And we were doing this repetitively. So you can get away with doing this in the clinic, and you can get away with doing this in some studies if you don't do it very often. We are doing it once a month. And so we needed to prove that our that urine was an adequate sample to at least represent the male urethra. So we gathered samples from men with and without STIs. We had we were doing this at the STD clinic as well. So they were getting urethral swabs for diagnostics and urine samples. We did the 16S sequencing as usual. And basically if you see through the top 20 organisms here, with the one or two exceptions, we found very little difference between the, the, micro, the microorganisms that we saw with swabs and the ones that we saw with uh, urine tests. And we did that with, in the men without sexually transmitted infections and found much the same thing. And at least used this as evidence that as, as a place to begin in a natural history study, of the male urethral microbiome, 
that urine was a sufficient sample to give us a place to understand what was going on. And the other piece that I want you to get here is can come back to this idea of what's there, what's present in men's urethra, in this case represented by the urine, a lot of lactobacillus, a lot of other kinds of organisms that you see, start seeing down some others that you may recognize better, the ureaplasma, the mycoplasma, other kinds of organisms that you've seen probably in discussions related to sexually transmitted infections. So this is a brief description of the, of the work that we did. 14 to 17 year old, they're just finishing now. Some of the young men have now been in the study for three years, so some of them are pushing 20. Uh, we did a, a web-based computer-assisted self-interview at enrollment and every three months. We gave them cell phones and service so that every day they logged in to our, our uh, web page answered a diary that focused on sexual behaviors, pretty detailed, about sexual interactions with partners, about masturbation, about symptoms. We use the NIH prostatitis scale to, to assess symptoms, urethral discharge, dysuria, scrotal pain, things like that on a daily basis. And they obtained for us monthly self, coronal self swabs, so we um, had to buy a flaccid penis model. Do you know where, where you buy flaccid penis models? I didn't either. But do you know what happens if you put flaccid penis model into your, into your internet search engine? You find flaccid penis models. So in fact, I spent federal dollars on two flaccid penis models so that we could train our young men on how to obtain the coronal sulcus swap themselves in their home, in their bathroom, so that we could do this on a repetitive basis, month in and month out, for three years. And self-obtained urine samples that we used and did sequencing and DNA and um, STD testing on the urine samples. This is the way the, the specimen collection looked in terms of the organization of the study, the monthly samples at enrollment um, and exit as well, and then monthly. Whenever the young men reported on the diary that they had a symptom or had a specific behavioral sexual event, we showed up at their house with cups and asked them every other day to give us another sample so that we could trace the changes in the microbiome over time. If on one of the monthlies, one of the STI tests was positive, we then showed up again at their house and collected samples so that we could trace changes during infection and through treatment. For example, if they got doxycycline for a chlamydia infection, we would be able to change, see how things change over time. We don't have all of those data put together yet. This is what we began to see. This is out of a paper we published in the first 18 men in PLOS One a year or so ago. And there are a couple of things that I want to point out that I'll point out in, in more detail in a minute. The first is that the coronal sulcus, if you look at the high proportion of staphylococcus, the high proportion of coronal bacteria, and that large group of other things, the Prevotella, the Porphyromonas, the Fingolia, the Delphia, all of those things that have been associated with moist environments. And then look at the urine, and the distinction there is that you see a lot of Streptococcus, which you didn't see on the coronal sulcus. You see Lactobacillus, which you didn't see on the coronal sulcus. You see Gardnerella, which you didn't see on the coronal sulcus. And then when you look at that in a slightly different way, so that it's set up to compare the coronal sulcus and the urine based on whether or not the young man was circumcised or not, what you see first is the point I already made is that the streptococcus is something you only see in the urine. And it doesn't ma matter too much whether they're circumcised or not. It's only present there and not on the coronal sulcus. Did you also see here, as I also made this point, that this, 
extent. The staph is what you primarily see on the coronal sulcus, but it comes after circumcision primarily. And then the point also that I made that Gardnerella and Lactobacillus are present in the urethra, in the urine, but not present, and it doesn't matter whether they're circumcised or not. But then if you remember that study I showed you of the men from Kenya before and after circumcision, remember that the Prevotella went away after circumcision? We saw the same thing here in the sense that the circumcised, that we saw Prevotella only in the circum, only in the uncircumcised men. But we saw it both on the coronal sulcus and in the urine. And my point with that is that these may be distinct body compartments, but they're not perfectly separated. So that there's an over, so circumcision in this sense I'm proposing affects not only the coronal sulcus microbiota, but also the urethral microbiota. And that may explain, at least partially, why circumcision also affects rates of other sexually transmitted infections, such as gonorrhea and chlamydia. I don't have proof for that, but I'm proposing. So when we look at the potential effects of sexual exposures, sorry, we see not a strong effect yet. We're Part of the problem with studying teenagers is no matter what your underlying assumptions about how much sex young men have, they aren't having as much as we think they are. And so part of what we've had to do is wait to accumulate enough sexual exposures to actually be able to get. But we, we've started to see some sense that at least when you look at the urethra, at the urine, that there are some effects of different kinds of sexual exposure, less from the vagina than from the mouth. So if you see here, the young men who only reported oral sexual exposures were the ones that had the highest proportion of lactobacillus in the urine. And the ones that had at least some oral exposures were the ones that had Gardnerella, again, the organism associated with bacterial vaginosis. This is consistent with observations in women as well of an association of bacterial vaginosis or Gardnerella with oral genital sexual exposures. So it brings into my sense anyway of the complexity of the interactions of these different kinds of sexual behaviors with the genital infections that we normally identify as sexually transmitted. We also wanted to know if whether there was any sense that these were stable populations because they'd been so difficult to study. So again, we took this lactobacillus enters and tried to ask if, if it was present at enrollment, was it still present in each subsequent month? And as you can see, at least for these four subjects that had lactobacillus enters present at all in their enrollment sample, for all but one of the subsequent samples of this building. And these are the same, at least they correspond to the same reference strain, which is marked by the asterisk. That gives us some sense that whether, although there may be some fluctuation in populations, there may also be a stable resident population of particular species within the male urethra. And I promise I'm coming to a, toward an end here. So one of the other kinds of things we wanted to begin to look at is, is what kinds of things you would see with or without a sexually transmitted infection that we could identify, in this case, chlamydia trachomatis. We just haven't seen much gonorrhea. We haven't seen much trick. We've seen a good, a good bit of mycoplasma genitalium, actually. Um, and whether or not they had pyuria. We've seen a lot of young men with episodic pyuria. So they'll come up, they'll have white cells in the urine, they'll typically be asymptomatic. Sometimes they'll be present for two or three months running. The, the, the nucleic acid diagnostics are negative. They don't have any of the organisms that we, that we can traditionally look for. And then the white cells go away. 
So we classified those and looked at them in terms of their, the association with others. And you can see here this arcane bacteria, Diacrobacter, which is found in rice paddies and activated sludges, was present only in the, in the young men, in very in small amounts, in the men with chlamydia and not at all in the young men with pyuria, but nothing else. And Feingoldia and Gemella were both present only, and these are the same, same groups of young men, only in those that had this episodic pyuria. Now, if these young men with pyuria showed up at the STD clinic and were tested, they'd be treated for non-gonococcal urethritis on the spot, even if they were asymptomatic, probably. And this begins to help me begin to think into that particular issue of what's going on in the young men that often sometimes have symptoms, sometimes don't, have white cells, often don't respond to treatment over a period of time, sometimes do. Sometimes you see them month after month after month in the STD clinic and you still don't know what's wrong with them. So the other, the final thing we wanted to do is try to get a sense if that idea of who goes with the chlamydia when it travels, and does it make a difference in terms of who's there? So we took baseline samples. We took those that had chlamydia infections at time zero. We looked at their samples from the month before. This is the big advantage of prospective data. And we looked at them for the month after, after they've been treated. One of the things that we've seen is that if you lay all of those out, one of the effects, one of the things that is associated with chlamydia infection is that the diversity, so the number of different organisms within a specific sample, how varied is the population, especially in terms of its abundance, as it runs through the chlamydia infection. So as you can see, even the month before, so the month before their diagnostic chlamydia test is negative, even before that we had already seen an increase in diversity. We think this may represent this initial perturbation of the microenvironment of the urethra that precedes the chlamydia infection itself. I don't know that for sure. I don't think these data are strong enough to say much more than that. It's suggested to us it's a place to continue to explore because that suggests other ways to influence chlamydia infections other than just giving antibiotics for it. We saw a change in the, the total number of sequences and the final stuff I just wanted to present is that some things change in the men that get, have chlamydia. So this is all of the, the subjects that had chlamydia. The month before, you can see that a number of them had Feingoldia, five of them. At the same time that they got chlamydia, most of them had lost their Feingoldia, all but one. Some participants got an organism over the course of their chlamydia infection. In this case, they acquired Valinella after they had been treated for the chlamydia, which wasn't present the month prior to their chlamydia infection. I don't know what those organisms might be doing. There were some hypotheses in terms of the kinds of things that might be happening. But those are the kinds of things that we've began to inquire about. So just to sum this up, pushing this idea that form, function, and microbiota are really the essential kinds of things that we have to be able to begin to understand. The coronal sulcus and the urine have distinct but potentially interacting and overlapping microbiota, relatively stable populations, at least of some organisms. The importance of the alteration of the microbiota by circumcision but not just of the coronal sulcus, but of the urine as well. The alteration of the microbial communities, primarily in the urethra by sexual exposures, and the way that sexually transmitted infections may interact 
with the microbial communities and increase the likelihood of it and the way they change then after we've treated them. All of those, I think, are the places that we're going with this research as we move more into it. I want to thank all of you for joining me with this. It's been a pretty quick trip over a lot of data. I have a spectacular team of people that I work with at Indiana, at the University of North Texas, and at Washington University, and some extraordinary people on my field team who've done this 364 days a year for the past three years. They got Christmas off. And then for the, those of you that are really interested in penises, I recommend the, the, the Phallus Museum in Iceland. Thank you very much. Hello, operator? Yes. Can you open the phone line for people to ask questions, please? Thank you. Yes, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone and record your name at the prompt. Please wait a moment for any incoming questions. Oh, I can go now? Thank you, Dennis. Having, as I told my son, examined over 5,000 penises at the city clinic in San Francisco when he was very worried about the size of his penis going to puberty, um, I have a lot of questions about the penis. I have learned that it's an important organ to men. They're very concerned about it, so it doesn't surprise me that people are willing to swab and swab and swab and make sure everything's okay. But we did see a lot of pyuria in men who masturbated a lot. So I'm curious to, you know, as to whether or not you saw a correlation with masturbation in your pyuria sample that had no evidence of infection. Right now we have not. Oh. Um, although we, we actually, I trust our reports, we have a good proportion of reports. If anything, I think it's associated with oral sex. But even that right now I think is preliminary. Thank you, Dennis. That was terrific. With the voice study results being out right now and the whole issue of how much do you pay, what happens to the subjects in response to how much you have paid, I think this is fantastic work, uh, both for you and for your subjects. And I am wondering what you had to do in terms of compensation. Well, the, com the big incentive here is the cell phones and the bigger incentive than that is the is the service so because we asked them to use these as study instruments we pay for all of that so they get a pretty big compensation for that we give them some compensation for the daily diary reports and we actually have have a little accounting device on the phone so that Every time they log in, they know how much we owe them, um, and we pay them monthly. So, um, And part of my philosophy is I don't engage research participants as volunteers in the sense that whatever they give me is okay. I engage them as employees of the research, and I ask them to deliver. Now, I'm a pretty easy boss in general, but especially with my research participants. So I'm pretty flexible, but I still have standards, and they have to deliver or I put them out. So, Dennis, one of the confounders when you're talking about um, looking at the male microbiome is what the females are doing. So the issue is the instance of um, spermicides, um, intravaginal agents, tampon use, um, anything else. Um, that could potentially, you know, affect what goes on in the penis. And then in your, I don't know how many of the um, gay men you may have, but in terms of lubricants and changing, we know that most of these lubricants are hyperosmolar um, that potentially the women may be using. And so the influence of those particular agents um, or other things um, on your results. Yeah, about five of the 75 um, 
participants have had at least one same-sex partner. Um, some of them have had both male and female partners. Uh, others have had no partners at all. So we've got a nice variability. We haven't fully sorted out all of the um, all of those issues. And I, I think your point about the fact that this is a two-person issue, which is really germane to the structure of my talk, is exactly right. We just have not fully solved the design issues required to do a partner study in adolescence. It's just difficult to do. It's tough to do in adults. Um, we can do this in using young men or young women without involving their partners because we involve their parents and we involve them in everything that we do. But when you add a second parent who may or may not know that their, that their son or daughter is involved in a relationship, whether it's sexual or not, it, it becomes nearly overwhelming from a design perspective. And I'm pretty adventurous in putting studies into the field, and I just haven't figured out how to do that one yet. But I'm okay. Are there questions on the phone? Yes, we did have a couple questions queue up. Our first question comes from Denise Anderson. Denise, your line is open. Hi, Denise. Yes, hello. Um, I missed part of the presentation because um, a different time zone. I'm wondering if you have a PowerPoint that you could send. It will be posted on the on the Division of STD Prevention website. So, Can you yeah. repeat the website, the name of the website? It's CDC. It's the Division of STD Prevention website. If you send your request to Patricia Jackson, I'll make sure that you get the link to the website. Thank you. One other question? Our next question comes from David Martin. David, your line is open. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Dennis. Hi, everybody. It's really interesting to see how these data are evolving. <clears throat> to answer Kim's question, um, is, uh, it's very correct that doing the studies, even in adults, is difficult. We've got about 200 couples that we've studied out of our STD clinic, so we'll be able to address some of those questions uh, soon, I hope. So, Dennis, I wanted to ask you, uh, have you done uh, principal components analysis on these data? I was very interested to see the change in flora, or at least based on uh, the presence or absence of organisms, because you didn't present any abundance data, but it looked like the men before they got a chlamydia infection had a shift in the flora. And so you've been doing this work. What you showed us was the, the presence or absence data. Have you, have you done principal components analysis? Or are you planning to do that uh, with, with these men to see whether the overall flora is changing significantly? Yeah, it's a great question, Dave. And we have done it. The, and I, I just didn't feel comfortable yet with the data. In part, you know, we've got about 15 total chlamydia infections. Now, that's a pretty high incidence of disease, but it's just not quite enough to help me be comfortable that those representations are 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 sufficient to to put in front of people yet. Yeah, hopefully you'll be able to get enough cases to do that. That'll be fascinating. Yeah, I think I, I, my, you know, my worst fear is that we will, it'll be tantalizing but not definitive. Uh, oh, that'll be the basis for more grant proposals. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking with it. Other questions? We are showing no further questions at this time. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Dennis. And we do have a discussion session, which is scheduled to start at 2.30.
where you can have more intimate questions and answers with Dennis. It will be in Building 11 in Room 2214. Am I right, Patricia? Room 2214, Building 11. Thank you all. That does conclude our question and answer session. You may disconnect at this time.